So what I wanted to cover <clears throat> for this one, I already wrote a little bit on, on my critique of this in the critique uh, community, which I recommend you all join, by the way. And if you want images critiqued by me, please submit your work there. I will choose from there. Um, but what I was covering basically is that this needed a wash. It needed a wash. Uh, stuff that's underwater, let's say you have um, a box, all right? So you have a box. In that box is water. Water has no color, all right? It adapts the colors around it. Let's say on that box is a roof. And the inside, the bottom part of that roof is blue. All right, so this water, along with the light that's behind this blue, so let's say this blue roof is see-through. And out of this blue roof is coming, uh, um, from behind this blue roof is coming yellow light. All right, this yellow light is shining through. Yellow plus blue equals green. I can't really ask you guys questions because there's major lag in this uh, YouTube version streaming. But we get green. But essentially, before we get the green, we get like a bluish shade in the water. All right, and then we get a little bit of the yellow on top of that. They don't really blend that well here. I'm going to have to bring in my own saturation. So the blue turns into something that looks a little more green, a little more uh, turquoisey, aqua-y. It's still very blue. So this is generally the color of water underneath. It depends on the time of the day. It depends on the composition of the water, seaweed, other stuff, um, surrounding land, type of ecosystem. But essentially, this is what happens. The sun unifies and creates a light through the color of the sky, which is a result of water shining through the water in the atmosphere or something. And that brings in the blue, the final little bit, which is the blue in the in the water and the green in the water. So we, so the water is a reflection of what's happening up here. All right. When you have, let's say you bring in a green marble or a yellow marble or a red marble or a purple marble, that purple marble will have, you get this purple marble and you toss it in here. That purple marble isn't going to stay the same saturation it was when it was outside of the water. It's going to have that water color influence it. So we're going to get color layer and then throw it over. That's going to be the color of that marble underwater. That's how you create the atmosphere. In the air, when we have high humidity, we have atmospheric fades. So uh, atmospheric fade uh, Puerto Rico. It's a very, very humid place. Um, Oh my God, it showed me a fade. Um, all right, Puerto Rican hills, Puerto Rican mountains. Probably in, all right. So Puerto Rico is very, very humid and it's very, it's like a big box of humidity. And what happens is that the atmospheric fade, even though this is technically not that far away, look at the atmospheric fade that happened. We usually see this level of atmospheric fade in the mountains that are this distant in the, in the back, much smaller than this. So this is because there's a little bit of water in the air. Imagine having an atmosphere where it's all water. There's going to be even more atmospheric fade happening. So I love what you did over here. Over here. All right, I love what you did here. But I do not like how, um, oopsie, don't sign your images like this. I'm just going to be very uh, um, honest about it. It's tacky to sign with large stuff like that. Don't sign like that. Sign with a little bit more um, discretion. Use a color in the palette that's already there. It'll work better to your advantage and represent you. Your signature represents you. If you guys sign your work, I don't sign my work for, for me. I don't know how to feel like I don't have to sign my work. But um, I recommend you guys sign your work um, a little bit more discreetly. But... Uh, Basically, what you have to do now is choose a color wash. Water doesn't really turn purple. Like, if you're a concept artist and you want to show that the world is different, let's say you're painting um, as just a whole new world, uh, you have to make changes so that the water still looks like water, but it has its own little unique characteristics. So what we get is um, like a purpley or pink water, underwater color. But because this is the earth and this is what we know and you're drawing sharks and it's clearly the earth, we will have a bluish color because that's the color of our sky, especially if the sun is so bright and so yellow. 
So I'm going to get that bluish color. I'm going to stay away from purples. I'm going to push it towards the green because remember how the sun reflects and changes that color. I'm going to put this on color and I'm going to brush that over everything. Now, not only does this start to read a little bit more when we do that, but we're doing it in a way where in a second I'm going to erase away what I don't want. We're doing it in a way where objects still have their own colors. So the sun is shining through over here. So that means we're going to have a little bit more green near the top because blue and yellow create green. So we're going to have a little bit more blue over here, kind of getting more and more green. A little bit more green, sorry, kind of getting more and more green the closer we get to the sunlight until we eventually kind of start hitting the yellows. And the yellows are very tricky here because you can't use a pure yellow. This is underwater, so the wash is still the king. So we're getting an off-white yellow, and we're just going to place it right here. And that's starting to feel a lot like the sun is really shining through. Now everywhere here is going to get some of that yellow. So I'm going to erase away in a second, but everywhere is going to start getting that color. So I'm going to drop tool this color and just toss it over everywhere that is looking up. So areas on the side of the cube that are not looking at the light are going to be getting blue. But areas that are looking up are going to be getting this yellow. So it's a very ugly yellow right now, but it'll improve. And I go back, find that turquoise, complement it a little more. Okay, now I'm going to sort of bring down this, this color, the opacity of this color layer. And let's look at the before. Do you see what the problem was? It didn't feel like it was underwater. What we have to do is make sure all the yellow colors are unified through this cool blue. So there's, you can't just throw a blue over colors and expect them to be cooled down. What happens is that colors that are analogous, so colors that are beside each other, so all of these here are analogous. The purples, the blues, and the, and the turquoise. Um, all of these are neighbors. So those are the colors that you have to stick to underwater. So I'm going to erase some of these uh, patches away, revealing some of the purples of the coral. And it's pretty close to the, to the water, so it's going to get lots of uh, saturated, cool colors. But unfortunately, it's not going to get warm colors, because warm colors are very, it's very difficult for warm colors to be saturated in a not warm uh, color wash. And the sun, the light of the sun, the warmth of the sun doesn't travel well underwater. So what happens is, I would change the color of these completely. Look at that brown. That's, an up, that's above surface brown. That's soil. That color does not exist underwater unless, you know, there's enough sunlight revealing it or it's some sort of or the light of the camera is affecting it to look like that. If you're talking coral and reef, um, you're not going to get these colors. Some of this green is going to reflect on the ground where the light is brightest. Just like, oopsie, just like this. So this, we're going to have some of that green down here. Um, needs to be a little more saturated. But this is how you unify colors in an environment. You have to choose the wash. Let's see what other colors you chose. So it's pretty much, that's it. It's just here. And then the greens, the greens will be a little bit more blue-green than yellow-green. You chose a yellow-green. You chose an above-surface green, which is on the green. You can't do that. Green that is cooled down by blue looks more like turquoise than green. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into color layer and then throw that green over top. And that'll be the green of that, the, the, that growth that's traveling. That'll be the green that you get. Okay, so can anyone summarize what I'm trying to talk about here? Can anyone kind of put it in a sentence? <clears throat> One second, please. Yes, blue is dominant. Blue is the color of the atmosphere of the area. You can't mess around with it too much. The lower you get, the more blue you get because there's less sunlight. So in the distance, I'm going to bring in a navy, which is a really, really dark blue. And I'm just going to, with a color layer, slowly introduce it into the lower areas. Because I can't let that green travel all the way down. So I'm going to throw that navy down there. And that's when you really get that purple. That's the only purple that you get, the deeper into the distance that you go. The top part of this cube here, 
which is the top part of the the reef wreath reef thingy sorry English wasn't my first language <laughs> um, this area gets a little bit brighter so this is like the form study it's gonna get a little bit brighter the closer it gets to damn it this cold is really bad um, the closer it gets to the light source over here so not everywhere just along the areas that are closer to the light source just like this Okay, so if this is for a game, this looks a lot more pleasing than the colors you had before. Um, if this is for like a children's book, so you have really nice colors going on, brightness, all that. It, it doesn't matter what you're using it for. Realism benefits whatever the media is going to be used for. Another awesome thing that happens underwater is the god rays. So you can do something like this. Right, you have a little bit of that happening. That was a lot more atmosphere, a lot more intrigue happening to the image than what you had before. So let's take a look at what happens when you don't balance your palette, when you don't choose colors that are appropriate to the atmosphere. You get a little bit of everything. Look at the yellow you chose. I mean, is it see-through? What happened? The water is too thick to allow this much yellow to pass through. Not even this much yellow passes through only if you're using a perfectly colorless prism through which white light gets divided into the rainbow. And then that's it. That's when light is passing through a subject still preserving its yellow. Other than that, the sun isn't even that yellow. The sun is really, really white. So you're still painting symbolically. <clears throat> so do you, do you see now what happens when you guys think about the atmosphere? And don't, don't ever make your signature so large it seems like it's a prop. And another thing that you did is the shark. You used a stamp for the shark, but you haven't shaded him. The shark will still get a significant amount of shading to him, even if he's in the distance and doesn't have that much um, light shining on him or that much detail. He'll still, you know, the top part of the shark will still get some light on the side of the shark and the fin like that as he's wet passing over. Same with the distant shark. Just don't leave it a flat shade and then um, the light is sort of on him. He's in the way of the light. He's in the center of the image. All of everything is pointing to him and yet you have the foreground more detailed than the thing in the center of the image. That's not good. So I'm going to give him a little bit more and then darken to balance it so that they're both kind of have shades on them and stuff. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, some of these patterns here are a little bit, you know, cutting off too soon. You want to carry them all the way to the edge. And you want to work on these patterns a little bit. They're really defined and really sharp. So give them some definition. And I might end class early because I really don't feel well. I'm so sorry. I'm really pushing myself today. I'm trying really hard to make sure that I don't fail you guys. And this week has been so stressful because of stupid twitch. And it's been really, really hard to breathe. <laughs> because of the cold. Not because of anything else. Okay. Getting weird. One second, please. Okay. Um, that before looks like a live planet or empty fish tank. Yeah, more seat. Definitely looks like an empty fish tank. I'm sorry, one sec. Okay, <clears throat> so sorry. I'm just adding a little bit more edge work here on these ripples. I know I must rest, and I do, I try. But, um, you know, when you get stressed out, it doesn't really help flu. 
It seems like I've had this flu since like three years ago. Okay, so that's that. And I'm going to do one more little compliment, which is just throwing the majority of the peak of the, of the highlights just as, you know, moving toward that, that high point up there and not reflecting. And since the shark is standing right above the water, we have a chance to really have fun with this cast shadow. Kind of just mess around with that. Shadow still casts underwater. And I can throw a cast shadow there of the shark. And look what happened. Instantly there's depth. It's like, woo wee. There's depth. There's an environment. There's a bottom to this. And that, that's that's where all the fun happens. And if you want to know, okay, so she added a cast shadow. How does she know there would be a cast shadow? Well, form studies do that for you. Form studies definitely help you become, grow an instinct towards when cast shadows happen and when to look out for them and all of that. And I think that's it. I think I just need to frame the image since it is underwater. There, it's generally darker underwater. So I'm going to turn it on multiply. And um, just kind of frame the lower portions of this. So it seems like a bed, and at the bottom, or we're kind of hiding under a rock, taking a picture of this. And at the top, that's where the light is happening, so I can't really frame it with darkness, because it wouldn't really make sense to put a black border across where light happens. It's going to just cancel out, so I'm going to frame it with light just near the top. I'll multiply doesn't work like that. Um, probably color dodge. A little too strong, maybe. Okay, <clears throat> so do you guys see what happened here? I just need to wait for the responses. So filter, sharpen, unsharp mask, kind of losing some detail. And now this menacing, this menacing shark kind of really feels like he's approaching. And he really feels like he's he's the main issue now in the in the image, the main point of interest, and everyone's running away from him. And he's kind of like being introduced into the image the way an anime character is introduced into a saga. You know, they're all shadowed and mysterious and we don't know what kind of power they have and Luffy has to kick their ass. Luffy, water, coral, sea, pirates, it all connects. Don't you see? <laughs> okay. Um, underwater, you're going to have a little bit more bubbles. So these bubbles here that you created are a little dark to be bubbles. They, they could be a little bit lighter. And the point of highlight on the bubbles is so fun, just a fun word to say. Um, <laughs> I'm trying not to say it because it's too much fun. Um, the point of highlight is going to point to the light source. So I'm going to get rid of that bubble, <laughs> bubble highlight, and I'm going to get the light source color. So you have to get the light source color because that's where that light source is coming from. It comes with the color as much as it comes with um, the intensity, and that's what we throw over these bubbles here. Okay, they all have to point to the light source. And they need to be much lighter bubbles all around. One moment, please. Still painting on normal, right? Yeah, what happened? Oh. Okay, and then I'm just gonna lighten them up. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. So I'm gonna show you the before and after one more time. I really want you guys to take a look at what the color palette did to the um, to the environment. It brought in an environment. Thinking about the reflection of the light on areas that face it. Yeah, they seem to be too sharp. And the sharpness doesn't always come from how sharp you actually paint it. It comes from contrast. So that's why I'm using a lightened layer to bring down their darkness. They generally should be, they should have like motion blur to them or something. I'm going to use Gaussian. I mean, just the blur tool. 
and then the darken tool just to keep the the highlights on the bubbles focused in one area and they just get darkened along the edge around here okay so before after does anyone have any questions Yeah, they usually move you to the correct category, not flat out ban you. They didn't even give me a, a warning about my content saying, hey, don't do this or don't do that. They just outright ban me. They just completely ban me without a warning, without so much as a, an email asking me. Like, I even emailed them and asked them about what I should avoid in my channel because I teach through it. They just went and banned me without, without anything. So, <clears throat> I hate it because all my videos have the Twitch intro on them and I, I just... I shouldn't have wasted time with Twitch. Now all my videos are embedded with that um, announcement, so I have to edit all my video um, descriptions with the batch and just change it to no longer streaming on Twitch.tv. So I'm not streaming on Twitch. It's not from Twitch. It's on YouTube. I have to make a new video for that. I have to delete the old video. God damn it. <clears throat> Where does the bubble come from? Probably like heat or underwater um, methane deposits or something. <laughs> I don't know underwater heat from some lava ca causing water to boil. Would the drop shadow also um, show like the rays of light too? Um, uh, yeah, you can do that as well. You can have it so that the, the you can have that. It doesn't really matter at this point. You can, I mean the light would travel like this, uh, right? You can do that. That's a cool trick as well. It's traveling like that, but I think that's causing too much of a canopy, um, and it's the water isn't that thick. If the water is all swampy, it's not as blue as this. If it's all swampy, you will have something like that. The thicker the water, the more visible the light rays. Um, they shouldn't. They also shouldn't be perfectly spherical, but that's just nitpicking. Yeah, they should be a little bit more bub bubbly, and <clears throat> I like how it still reads as a shark, even though the light beam sort of covers it. Um, so that's weird. Hope you resolve it. It's okay, Mark Rich. Um, I'm not really interested in, in streaming on Twitch anymore. I don't care about Twitch anymore. I don't know why I never switch, uh, switched to YouTube. I just thought YouTube was um, underdeveloped. Um, it wasn't really um, working well back when I switched over. That was in the summer. Uh, so I guess they're they're much better now. They've changed a lot. The stream has changed a lot. There's much easier ways to stream now. They accept Open Broadcaster. Um, I, th I don't think they did when I was trying to switch over. Um, so yeah, I think I think we're gonna get nice and comfortable here on YouTube. Okay, so I hope this critique helped you. I'm gonna try to push for the rest of them. Um, not sure if I feel that well, but. Uh, for this image here, um, it's really just an anatomy problem. You should take a look at your reference that you used um, a little closely. The shoulders seem to be a little bit orbiting out. And the breasts are not the same size and not behaving the same. The, the general motion seems a bit stiff, so you should use more loose curved gesture lines to capture the gesture. Because that's going to lead to, if you don't do that, it's going to lead to a very stiff rendition. The rib cage is directly below the breasts, but the breasts are being lifted up by the arm. So this one would be a little bit less of a silhouette. And over here, I feel like her body entirely is just elongated, so it's pulling our eyes downward. There is much less symmetry on the eyes, so I'm trying to balance that. Uh, nice colors all around. I don't think you should make the skin tone so yellow. I think you should try to get away from that yellow uh, a little bit. So I'm going to push the palette towards the cools just a little. Um, because before it was a little yellow, but it's just a tiny thing. Skin doesn't really do that that much. It's not so yellow. It's green. It's hitting on green. And you want to close off the canvas because her gesture is leading our eye out. So you want to just cut the canvas out a little bit. 
Um, as for what you're doing with the image, um, is it a portrait or is it a or is it a full body illustration? So I think what you should do is kind of decide. I mean, you're so impressionist over here, kind of trying for realism here, and then a full body illustration that's making the image vertical, but the face isn't the only detail level. So you're kind of confusing things. I recommend a crop very similar to this and closing off the canvas and finding a less stiff option for the arm gesture. So something that's a little bit more kinda not taking attention away because her arm is movement and movement is detail. It's an extra level of intrigue. So what you want to do is kinda keep all the attention toward the eye and the portrait because that's really what dominates and then have her arm do something like that and that'll feel a lot more natural kinda of feel like she's forcing her arm up there or you didn't record the gesture properly but as an illustration I think you should really consider um, focusing on the portrait and then finding a light source. So you're not casting any shadows. It's too universal a light source. If it was sunlight, we'd have tons more saturation um, traveling across the image toward the the peaks, so the point of interest, which is the... I'm just kind of trying to saturate this, sorry. Let me go back. Erase away the forehead that got saturated. But yeah, you should really consider casting a light source. Um, you're not casting light on all the areas here. So the cheekbone should get some light on it if the forehead gets that much light. And if it's flowers and they're so close to her head, you really should be saturating those flowers. That's why I saturated them. Um, as for beauty, I think the general beauty in this image is kind of brought down. It kind of looks like a very boyish face. So if this is like a full copying of a reference, um, stick to it. But if you're not using a reference for the face or you deviated too much from the reference, you have to start um, adjusting the beauty. Because beauty needs to be exaggerated in illustration for it to read. It just doesn't work. So I'm simply pulling out of the knowledge of Elf and Ogre. I'm shrinking the nose. And I'm trying to make it so that the mouth is not far away from the rest of the face. And especially from the nose. If the, if the mouth is far away from the nose, what will happen is that it will feel old. I'm trying to give the eyes um, sort of like an almond um, lean and trying to balance the symmetry. Sorry about the liquify tool. It's very messed up. And you should kind of put in some intrigue into the face. The face is very boring all around, meaning that it has no expression. It's not really saying anything. It's like, oh, I'm wearing flowers on my hair. And that's it. I want to see, like, some intensity. So the gen gentleness of the flowers and the soft colors versus her, like, a really, like, uh, what I would do is I would give her a more stern look. So a little less softness in the lips. Um, more intensity in the eyes, probably some some menace or something. I don't know something for the for the eyebrows. Something a little bit more stern and editorial. Just trying to keep the eyes a little bit far apart. They were a little bit too close before. <coughs> So before, do you see how it kind of looked like a boy because you, the lips distance was a little bit too far and after we kind of just separated that bit, those bits from each other. Um, a couple more issues. It's very difficult to adjust on an angle because her head is tilting. Okay, give the cheekbones more definition and then just generally blend all of these areas together. And um, cast some shadows. 
So it would be nice if we could see a cast shadow here, cast shadow there, of course with different colors. Um, do something interesting with the makeup, um, something to sort of push the aesthetic. And don't use a simple ribbon to hide the nipples. Um, I think you hid them because you thought I was going to get banned or something. It's not on YouTube. YouTube doesn't do that. Need to have a little bit more shadow blending on the on the eyes. And I recommend cooling down the eyes. So using less yellow on the whites of the eyes. And if you have any of that, you know, makeup down here, saturate that as well. So if you've got greens, all of this is going to add to the aesthetic. <clears throat> A little bit more up here. It's only so much I can do in a short amount of time, but these hours pass by so fast, critique hours, because I really have fun with them. And more on makeup, um, I think you should get a color that's in the flower, in the flowers uh, for the makeup because it'll kind of tie everything together. So now it's not focused so much on her figure and if you wanted, really really wanted to do a figure drawing you should not have dressed it up. This should be just a study so I feel like you were caught in that trap of making your study a masterpiece. Because I will treat it as if you know you've made a masterpiece and I'm not, I'm, I'm going to suggest composition changes because I cropped the image. But if you don't want composition changes, you should not be adding a composition to an image that you didn't even plan for it to be a composition. You started it off as a study. So don't make those kinds of mistakes, guys. Um, so yeah, cooling down the eyes. So I'm going to go to color. I'm going to get one of these whites and just cool down the eye area. It's a little bit too yellow. That reads as something else. Um, I might get some of that color actually, that blue color, because that seems to be the sunlight color. And I'm just probably going to throw it over the face here to bring that green on red and make something that happen that's a little more intriguing. And just throw it over the skin. It makes the skin look a little bit more a little bit more realistic. Okay. So um before the crop, after the crop and then after the paint over. So before, after. I think that arm was way too stiff. I think the gesture is way too, um, uh, I don't know, that this, this whole putting your hand behind your head is, is so cheesy. You shouldn't be using it in your illustrations. Avoid that kind of stuff. See what you can do with gentle little changes. So this, the way you rendered this area is beautiful. So that's what you want to exaggerate, the fact that her spine is a little bit to the side. So a little bit of symmetry plus asymmetry works wonderfully. You shouldn't be depending on trying to make it look interesting by putting her hand behind her back. And then you see what happened when I shrunk the nose and brought the lips a little bit closer. That brought in that beauty back. Um, and also we added just a touch of sternness to her eyes, just something a little bit more model-esque or editorial. Just like that. And that green really complemented the skin tones, really brought in the sunlight. Maybe a little bit more on the sides of her, of her nose. So keeping the eyes separate from each other, shrinking the nose and keeping the mouth close to the nose is what brings in beauty. <clears throat> Um, I should quit art and become a naked florist. That's why it sounds way cooler. I said, I tried accessing your previous streams on my timeline, but I couldn't. Did you remove them on purpose? Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I did upload a recent one. I delete them after I stream because I have to edit them so that they're less long. Or else they'd be, like, really, really long. <clears throat> Um, stream crash for anyone else. Shouldn't have crashed. It would give me an error. Um, yep, everything's in order here. So I hope this critique helped you. I hope these before and afters are making a difference. Um, for this piece, I just wanted to tell you that the, that the face is too small. 
I mean, the head is too small for the face. Too much is happening, so what you want to do is shrink the face and fit it back in. Because you have to have some space for the chin, for the jaw, for the forehead, for the eye sockets, and for the outer quarters. I'm not usually critiquing 14-day challenges, but uh, this is definitely um, one of those issues I see you guys doing a lot in your 14-day challenges. You guys put too much feature, you know, two two big features on a small head. So you're not thinking about the skeleton. That's proof that you're not thinking about the skeleton. Go to Google, Google head, skull, human, <laughs> in that order, <laughs> and uh, and see what you guys are doing. You're not thinking about it. Look at the, how the symmetry is even on the skeletal level. And um, this forehead, I mean this, this neck is too close. Give it some length. The neck should be the same, the body should be the same color as the, as the head and the shadows should just be doing their thing. Cast some shadows, please. Whoops. Wild hand. Okay, so a shadow for the lower part of the nose. Identify where the light source is coming from. Okay, it works much better as a read. So before, after. You see how the head was too small for the face. Casting some shadows really makes a difference. I think the background is too light. You should go generally much darker. Okay. And uh, this piece here is beautiful form study, but what happened is um, you're kind of uh, making two sides really, really bright. The light is really bright on those sides, and yet this side here gets no secondary light source on it. If the brightness is that high, what happens is that this side gets reflected light because the room becomes brighter. So this much brightness happening on this object without the room being influenced is impossible. You guys forget to paint the room as you choose the colors in your, in your form studies. Oopsie. Didn't want to deselect. So this area gets a little bit brighter as well. Yes, it's part of the shadows, but it still gets brighter. Don't know why um, this is happening, uh, the banding. So we will have a little bit of a gradient happening on this side because the wall will have reflected. So that means that this whole area here should be brighter because that's the kind of environment this object exists in. It's in a bright environment, causing this much brightness to happen on it. So where you were before was a little bit too dark. And this area here is not light enough because you have to choose, okay, where, where's the light source coming from? Right, and I'll fix this. I'll just use the lasso. Just like that. And that feels like it's really part of the light environment there. Before it was a little bit dark. Okay. So flatten. So you had the rules down. The rules made lots of sense. Um, all you had was, you know, you weren't thinking about the light source as an environment that affects everything, not just the cube. And I know I ask you guys to choose the light source in this image and then choose the background as a gray, but the gray background is still involved in what's happening in the image. So before it was too dark for all that brightness to be sitting on it, it just didn't make sense that the, that the outside is not bright. What, what's happening? Is it in like a black hole? What, why is the light not reflecting the outer area? So this promotes that you guys are always thinking about the object as um, the lights visible on it are part of a bigger picture. This area would be a little bit brighter. Let 
remember your form studies are a reflection of your understanding of light and your knowledge there. So it's really important you guys remember that the light is affecting the object in more than one way. The secondary light source happens because the light hits the outside and then goes back and reflects on the object itself all over again. This promotes remembering this rule when you guys paint faces. And uh, that's what the form studies are for. They, they help you think about how to apply and bring back those rules that you learned in this form study, which is studying form for form's sake and light for form's sake and for light, light for light's sake. Because if you have a face that is so bright in a room that's that dark, how did that happen? So you don't have a light environment environment, and everything doesn't feel like it fits together, like you got a magazine cut out of one piece and stuck it with another piece you got out of another magazine page. They're not matching. Different photographs. Okay, the form studies are, are, are made for this purpose, to experience these rules without having to study a whole face just to learn the rule. They're a dedicated study. <clears throat> so, um, one second please. A dark open space with light on it would be a spotlight, and a spotlight does very different things to an object. You get really, really dark sides. That one dark side on this image was really, really dark. It should, would be really, really dark. So if this was part of a, a light environment that was a dark room, this bit here would be dark along with the rest of the image. and you'd have the highlights sit on very very particular spots. So let me see if I can select this. So this whole area would be this dark probably. If it was a spotlight this wouldn't be that dark. It would be at the same level. Oops. If it was a spotlight, if the room was the darkest thing, and what we, even if it was a white object, even if it was a white object, it would still have that extreme light, and one of these would be darker than the other. So this top piece would probably be darker than this piece. Now it feels like a spotlight. Now it's in a dark room with a spotlight shining on it. If it's a universal light, which you guys are supposed to be studying in a form study, you will get um, what I what, what the previous correction was. All right, so this is the same object just without a spotlight and all the lights turned off. Just with a spotlight and all the lights turned off. And over here is a universal light revealing the object in all its glory. This is how you're supposed to paint faces, and this is how you paint faces in a dark room with a spotlight on them. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, do you guys understand? <clears throat> For young shadows there, use a broad, sh broad brush, um, not a line. If it was a spotlight, um, would you get the edge like that? What edge? This edge right here? Yes, you would, because one of these is facing upward, the other is facing the other direction. So which of these looks at the light source better? If the light source is shining in here on the spotlight, which of these, because this is the rule, right? This is, if you've watched my other videos, you guys would know. Lasers come out of every one of these faces, okay? If these lasers are in any way parallel or close to parallel with the light source, they get illuminated. This is looking away from the light source. So it's looking this way. Light's like, hey, get my attention. It's like, no, I don't like you. And this one's like, I just hate you. I hate you, light source. This one's like, I don't even, I don't even like, you. I don't even like light sources. And this one's like, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm not part of this dumb crowd. But this one's like, yay, light source, be my friend, kisu. 
and then what happens is he gets the light source, he gets the reflection. These don't get as efficient to reflection. This one is nowhere near as bright as this one, but it is brighter than this one. It is brighter than this one and this one and then the one on the other side. So you have to think about whether or not the face is even looking at the light. It's not going to have this edge is not going to be this and this are not going to be the same shade. They're not looking in the same direction. If it was a universal light source, they would be close to the same shade. No, I meant for earlier than both both edges were light. Um, so that's that. It's for the earlier version. Um, the light is coming in, and a universal light source is coming in in such a way that it's like this. It's so far away. All of these seem like they're parallel. They're not, but they're they're so. So the light is so far away, it seems parallel, like the sun. So it's really allowing lots of the similar shades. This is still not looking at the light source. This is still not looking. So at a certain degree, they're going to change in shade. Same rule, different situation of light. But spotlight starts from a somewhere really close by, and they're nowhere near parallel to each other. So they're going to have different experiences with every face. Light doesn't just bend and suddenly illuminate something. Um, but thanks everyone for coming. Have a great day. Bye-bye.